there's six rewards for me for pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So it's flatter abs, better shaped butt, better shaped thighs, improved posture, dry nickels always, great sex. Which one don't you want? <laughs> It's <laughs> like, like, really? And I used to do, do talks and I'm like, well, actually, I can tell how well your pelvic floor is working by the shape of your butt. Welcome to the Lifestyle First podcast, discussing lifestyle medicine and making self-care as easy as one, two, three. And now your host, lifestyle medicine physician and coach, Dr. Alka Patel. Hi, hey, and hello, and welcome to Series 10, Episode 4 of the Lifestyle First podcast. So the theme that we are exploring today is E for exercise. And this week, we're actually moving to an area that you probably don't think enough about exercising. It is your pelvic floor, which is why the one question that we're asking today is, why is pelvic floor exercise the forgotten exercise. So to help me answer that, I have with me Jenny Russell. Jenny, hello. Hi, Alka. Thank you for having me. No, look, I'd love to uh, introduce you to everyone because I think it's a real understatement if I say that you are a woman on a mission. So Jenny is on a mission to help women become confidently continent and sexually satisfied. She wants women to just live life better without embarrassing leaks or fear of intimacy and she's written two fantastic books on the subject of pelvic floor exercise the books are your pelvic floor secrets and can a vagina really buy a mercedes now that title alone should entice you to to want to read it so jenny welcome and Let's start with your books. I've uh, had a look at your book, okay. Pelvic Floor Secrets, in fact. And you start off in there talking about the importance of foundations. So how the mm. important thing to be celebrated, and you use the analogy of a house, in a house is its very strong foundations on which it's built. So I wonder if maybe you could kick us off by describing the pelvic floor and how this is that foundation on which the rest of us is built. Okay, my pleasure. Do you know, I used to have this wonderful laminated pelvic floor model that I could fold. And it just, I think at one of my um, events that I did, somebody decided they were going to have it instead. And it's so annoying because it's literally the size of a pelvis and it was cut out and color coded so you could really fold it. Mm. But if you um, think about the pelvis, I always just think about taking the hands and cupping them together like so. Mm. And literally, this isn't really far off the size of literally the inside of the bony pelvis. And if you think of the pelvis being at the base of the trunk, it's here, you think every bone in the body is covered by muscle, but the pelvis is special because it has all the muscles on the outside, the hips, the thighs, the butt, but on the inside, it's lined by this group of muscles, which we call the pelvic floor. And then it has obviously for women, it has the three openings, which is the urethra, the um, vagina, and the anal canal. In men, obviously, it's just the urethra and the anal canal. But this springboard of connective tissue, muscle, fascia, ligaments has to actually hold up literally the entire contents of our internal organs. But not only that, if you think of the pelvis as this bony structure that's just this bolts here, the legs link into it here, the trunk sits on it here, the arms into the trunk, into here, the head onto the trunk, into here. So everything has to meet in this position here and so this really is like the foundation of the trunk and the reason why I liken it to a house is because where you are now in your beautiful house where I'm in my beautiful little house you know the ability to sort of run around jump around and do whatever and have all these things that, that we put up and display we're able to do that because what we don't see is what holds up and supports the floor supports the side walls supports the roof mm -hmm. It's literally the base, like the trunk and the head of kind of, and the diaphragm, that's like the side walls. So the, the diaphragm is the roof, the abdominal wall and the back is the side walls and the pelvic floor is the base. It's the same difference. And if that foundation isn't strong, then the side walls and the top are not able to do their job as well. And the internal stuff that's in between the bits that you see, those things won't stand. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. So given that you've described this as something that's so fundamental, foundational, needs strength, I mean, we're, we talk about muscles all the time, don't we, and muscles needing mm. strength, but why are we not talking about pelvic floor muscles in the same way? Why is there not this conversation being had when we talk about exercise? We forget that this mm. is the foundation. Well, that's a really good question. And I was thinking about this question earlier on today, like, why do we not think about it? And really, it's because we can't see it. Literally, it's, it's really that out of sight, out of mind. So what we have right now is a society that's really based on the aesthetics. We've put how we look over how we function. So it's not about function, it's about form, it's about shape, it's about what we do. So we'll either inject the butt or we try to work it. We'll inject the thighs or we try to work it. We'll suck out the stomach. We might decide to try and work it. We'll prop up the, the breast. We'll do everything to get this shape that we're chasing mm. so that we look good. But we've forgotten about how we function. And that's the difference. The pelvic floor, funny enough, the, the pelvic floor does help you to make, make you look really good, but we don't understand that. We see it as just a set of muscles for sex and babies. Or we don't really regard it as the limited nature muscles we just think about it as sex and babies so if we're not having sex we're not making babies we don't think it has a role to play we don't know it's everyday role and that's the problem yeah yeah and certainly you know from my background work as a gp when i've had ladies who bring up the conversation they do it at mm. a point which where things are so desperate they're not coming at that early sign or even preempting that the pelvic floor might be affected by childbirth and, and don't seem to want to open up a conversation about it. And it takes quite a lot of very delicate probing to even enable women mm. to come forward with sharing what's going on with them. Again, what do you think it is about the subject itself of discussing things like continence and constipation and childbirth <laughs> that we just don't want to do because it's embarrassing so if somebody's constipated who wants to tell the doctor i can't poop you know i'll, I'll make a you know a minute a, a fully compacted colon can weigh as much as 10 pounds a full bladder can weigh as much as four pounds that's a stone of extra weight and if somebody's not shifting that then they're kind of really full of rubbish you know i'm putting it politely now I use it in some of the workshops to kind of break the ice and make people laugh because they don't look at it that way. But we look at it as holistic healthcare professionals as also an emotional sign of not letting go. So it's linked to anxieties and stresses and, you know, not just poor nutrition, but a lot of anxiety and stress is linked to this issue here. The root chakra, if you look at it in Chinese medicine, it's the root chakra linked to safety and security and our sex and relationships. And we don't build a good relationship with ourselves because we're just really about what's going on outside. And I suppose in the same way that, you know, you said as a, as a GP, a lot of people come to you with whatever ailment when the ailment's really bad, yeah. not when they think something is just beginning to go wrong. We wait to, you know, you can ask a question and I could come and say, no, Dr. Alka, my back's been hurting me for, you know, a little while. And you say, how long? Oh, just a little while. When did it first start? Oh, last April. And not April 2022 to April 2021. You have to ask more questions. But I suppose when it comes to the pelvic floor, I think a lot of women that I've had, a lot of the clients that I work with, they say, well, most doctors are male. So because they're male, they don't know how to approach that conversation. Because the pelvic floor is quite time intensive, they feel that there's not enough time given and not enough compassion and not enough understanding. And because the adverts say it's a natural part of the aging process, people just go, oh, well. I drew the short store. I'm one of those people that's going to suffer. So I'll just cover it up. Yeah, yeah. And that is a very, very common scenario, common situation that women do mm. find themselves in. It's just a space to have more open conversation. So what do you think we need to be talking about? And actually, more importantly, before what we need to talk about, when should we be starting to have conversations about wow. pelvic floor and pelvic exercise? If I have my way tomorrow, it'll be on the school curriculum mm. yeah. all day long. Because I look at the pelvic floor, like I said, we're born with this pelvis, women and men. We're born with this set of muscles that has to support the internal organs and has to help control our gait and our movement ability. It has to help support the spinal column. So then it has a role to play in posture. 
if we recognize the everyday role of sports performance, performance in general, posture, movement ability, the shape and contour of the lower abdominals, the butt, the thighs, we'd be more inclined to go, oh, okay, yeah. okay. It's got an everyday role to play. It, it plays a major role in how I move and what I do in my confidence and my ability to do things. So maybe I will pay attention. And if we, you know, in the um, Yonder approach, there's a great book called um, Assessment for Treatment for um, Muscle Imbalance. It's mm -hmm. the Yonder approach. And in page 30, I've got it all highlighted. It just talks about the pelvis being the cornerstone of stability for the rest of the body. So it's linked to knee sprains, groin strains, um, hamstring pulls and tears, low back pain. And if you think a lot of, a lot of sports, especially footballers and male sports, mm -hmm. athletes, they suffer these things all the time. But nobody goes to think, okay, well, let's actually look at the pelvis and see what's happening in this basin. You know, where is it? What's, what's short and tight? What's long and weak? And how is it affecting the way in which we're moving off, pulling up? No one's looking at that. And so therefore, we, you know, these recurring injuries, especially in footballers, what mm. happens to them? I've worked with professional footballers. They get cortisone injections during the academy. And it's very few that actually make it out of the academy and make it into any first team. So they spend years of their pubescent years when things should change as well then, yeah. training for a sport they're hoping they're going to make it in and make lots of money, but actually end up injuring themselves because that's the cornerstone stability for the rest of the body, which does not get looked at. And no one's looking at how we integrate that into their everyday exercise. They find themselves with groin strains, knee and ankle sprains, hamstring tears, and before they get started, they're finished. And that's mm -hmm. really sad. So if we actually were able to inform football teams, basketball teams, netball teams, sports performance about the pelvic floor, the emotional issues with the pelvic floor, the nutritional issues and the structural issues in a way that's engaging because it's a very technical subject. Mm -hmm. So we've got to find a way to make it really user-friendly. Then I think we'd have a much better outcome and a much better position. Mm -hmm. And I think you've already started doing that even in this conversation when you suddenly started talking about your core and lots of people are talking about mm. their core. You know, you see people at the gym all the time doing endless, endless yeah, yeah, yeah. Core, um, core, core. Uh, which uh, I'm sure is not the right thing. But suddenly attaching pelvic floor to core strength makes it feel more attractive. Suddenly maybe mm. attaching the pelvic floor to um, relationships and connection and better connectivity and better relationships suddenly makes it something that you want to focus on. So I think it's about disassociating what can feel like something we don't want to talk about because of its connections mm. with perhaps continence and constipation that we've already touched on to actually associating it with positive outcomes that we are all looking for and wanting, right? Definitely. So, I mean, I've had a, a banner made years ago and I've always said there's six rewards for me for pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So it's flatter abs, better shaped butt, better shaped thighs, improved posture, dry nickels always, great sex. Which one don't you want? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, really? And I used to do, do talks and I'm like, well, actually, I can tell how well your pelvic floor is working by the shape of your butt. Mm. And at the end of the conference, at the end of the workshop, people go, can you look at my butt, please? Can you look at my butt, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. But it's a great way of actually breaking the ice. It's a great way of getting the conversation. Like, well, how does it affect my lower abdominals? What do you mean it affects my posture? How does it affect my thighs? You know, it's, it's, it's that thing. Seriously, everything you're chasing in the gym, yeah. it's all here. It, yeah. it just wants mm -hmm. to be worked. And mm -hmm. then also, like I said, emotionally, it's affected by, you know, emotional baggage by poor relationship choices, you know, low self-esteem. Yeah. If it works really well, how can nobody thinks about it? You know, you, and I link it completely to your confidence. It actually tells you who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. If it's working well, because it's out of sight, we don't think about it, it's not a problem. The minute it brings something to your attention, then, you know, planning an, an afternoon out. Say we're gonna go to the theatre. You might think, well, I'll put a sexy little dress on. I've seen you've got a lovely little body on you. So you'd be like, I'll put a nice little dress on, do my hair, put some makeup on, or go mm. out, maybe we'll have some champagne before we go, whatever else. But a person suffering from incontinence is thinking, what colour clothes shall I wear? Mm. What time shall I stop drinking? When I go to the bar with Alka and Jenny, I'm going to make excuses because I don't want to drink too much in case I have to run to the toilet. 
when we get into the Royal Albert Hall, say, our seats are right in the centre of the aisle. Our friend is now looking to the left and the right, like, where's the signs for the toilet? Because that's what they want. Then they get in, and you know already in the intermission, the ladies' queue is always really long, yes? Mm -hmm. So they get to that queue, and they're four or five from the front, and now they know if they don't go now, that's it. So they tap the person in front and say, excuse me, do you mind if I just go before you? I really need to go. So do I. And that's the response they get. But, you know, if one in three women are suffering, maybe those four or five before them, one or two of them is actually the same as your friend. So all of a sudden, just a planning an evening out can be as, as much as dark closed or, sorry, I can't come, something's come up, and then social isolation starts. But it, all of a sudden, your personality, who you are, how you move, what you're going to do, it all changes just because you have a pelvic floor secret that you've been told is the natural part of the aging process, which completely isn't. Yeah. That makes sense. Oh, gosh, you really touched on the rawness of it there, Jenny, and really described in, in real visuals about actually how it feels for so many mm. women. I mean, one in three is a huge statistic. I think we should just pause and think about that. That's one in three women who are feeling silenced by what they're experiencing mm. who are experiencing the social stigma for you know want of a better word of what they're experiencing who can't even in the queue of women also say can I go before you because go before you. I've got issues with my continence they can't share the reason it's just a, a tap on the shoulder and I think that's yeah. really really important isn't it is to be able to have a space to share some of that vulnerability and not think of it as a vulnerability, but actually be able to mm. be in a position to do something about it. Because this isn't just aging and a default that you fall into. There's lots of things that we can do to actually yeah. not, and need this to be a secret. And now here is your lifestyle first prescription. Your three activating actions to take you from knowing to doing. Can you touch on then perhaps one or two things, one or two very early telltale signs for women that might alert them to take some action? Oh, gosh. So I think, I suppose in terms of continence, I know a lot of med medical professionals now see it as the first stage of organ prolapse. But I think with incontinence, it's that little sneeze and then go, oh, there's that little feeling that you've lost something. And a great way to, because if I go back slightly or deviate slightly what we have to recognize is that nothing works in isolation so we can isolate muscles but we have to learn to integrate them and in terms of actually really getting the best outcome for our pelvic floor we have to be able to know what other muscles it works with alongside and work those muscles together isolate and integrate on that same loop so when you do sneeze there's this natural kind of natural girdle within the body that will do this and stop the pressure from within the cavity, the abdominal cavity, from springboarding down onto the bladder, the urethra, and allowing us to lose something. And I suppose when you look at even body shapes and where we are now, one of the roles for the abdominal wall is to actually help to support all the internal organs in their natural position. Mm -hmm. But if we allow our, our tummies to become so deconditioned and so expanded, then we allow the internal organs to droop. So that's what they call visceratosis. They droop slightly. But then that means they're only going one place. They're going to go on to the reproductive and eliminatory organs and they're going to droop and that's going to put more pressure on the bladder and that's the, the sphincters, those little loops of muscles around it that stop you from leaking. One of the things you can do is to lay on your back, bend your knees, put your hand across your tummy and cough. And when you cough, see what happens. You can just lay down, flat, hand in your tummy, <coughs> cough. What happens? And the reason why I'm pausing is because I'm just giving you a chance to go and lay on your tummy and do that. Because <laughs> most people cough. And when they cough, what happens is the tummy goes, it goes out. Yeah. That's not correct. Yeah. When you cough, the tummy should be flexibly come in. Because that means that if you're doing that on your back and your tummy is going forwards, then what it's telling me is the protection that you need from the lower abdominals and that girdle are not working. And mm -hmm. so the pressure is just going to go downwards. So that's a telltale sign that you need to start looking at certain parts of the abdominal wall to, to condition 
and structure. Now, most classes, when you go to them, everyone's doing 60,000 crunches and yeah. pulling on the neck. But each segment of the abdominal wall has a role to play. And the upper abdominals that we're all working is really a great stabilizer for the shoulders and the neck and the head. Mm. So someone that does, you know, boxing and those kind of sports and that get hit from behind, you need to have really strong abdominal, upper erectus abdominal muscles, upper abdominals. But we're doing that for aesthetics. But that, that actually then pulls the chest forward and down and restricts the rib cage. And if it restricts the rib cage, it restricts the diaphragm. The diaphragm is restricted. And if the respiratory diaphragm is restricted, the pelvic diaphragm will be restricted. And you're going to have more, you're going to get more pressure and more problems because nothing's going to rock properly. It's just going to jolt. Yeah. So we have to understand which part of the abdominal wall plays a key role in our pelvic floor strengthening. And that's the lower abdominals, the transverse and lower abdominals. They tire very quickly. They're not so easy to engage, but we mm -hmm. need to learn to work from those and work from the bottom up and not from the top down. So that's, that's just a real important part for people to know, understand. And also the obliques, because they help to anchor the pelvis. So we need to understand that. Um, so that's the first thing I would encourage people to do. The second one I would do, I just mentioned about the diaphragm, is, is a breath test. So stand in front of your mirror or stand in front of a mirror and just inhale two or three times. And when you inhale, watch to see what happens. If I do it in a workshop, I get people to face each other. And I'll, again, I soften the eyes and I say, it's the only time you're allowed to stare at their breasts. The only time. But what you're going to do is you're going to watch them, take a deep breath in and just get them to do two or three breaths and actually watch what you see. And most times after you've done that, people say, well, the shoulders went up, the chest went up, the tummy went in. Or it's a very shallow, I just saw it will move in the throat mm. so all of those tell me that the breathing is off because a diaphragmatic breath is like putting air into a balloon yeah. so every time you inhale and the diaphragms move and they i say it's like an opening umbrella then as air goes in everything expands out mm. as air goes out everything comes back in but if your respiratory diaphragm isn't moving very well because it creates most of the pressure in the abdominals then the abdominals aren't moving very well, then the pelvic floor won't work very well. So technically it's like pressure fluctuation in the respiratory diaphragm, the abdominal wall, the pelvic floor. It's quite deep, but yeah. put it this way. If this isn't working, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. This is the pelvis. If this doesn't move freely, this won't move freely and it causes more problems. But we should be able to breathe in, expand, two thirds tummy, one third chest, exhale, and release and when we breathe in and we're breathing like that that sensory pathway from here downstairs to gina should actually you should actually feel an expansion happening within the vagina at the same time that's when you know you're connected yeah yeah it's very interesting you're talking about the breathing because i think most people won't have done that exercise to really know what an inhale and an exhale should be like and mm. for most people it's totally the opposite you breathe in and you think you're sucking everything in whereas actually yeah. that diaphragmatic breath is almost feels counterintuitive but mm. you know thank you for explaining it so beautifully in terms of that sort of expansile nature that we need to to feel so fine watch a baby breathe because when a baby breathes in yeah it goes yeah. in goes into that you don't see a baby breathe in and go you know and they said they're not well, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then we then we worry, but yeah, that, that's great to get mm. us back to back to the foundations, right? It's what we were born with, knowing how mm. to, what to do and how to how to do it. Um, and give us um, give us an exercise if you can, um, Jenny. Something that okay, they've done these two tests on themselves. Uh, oh, there's a telltale sign, little red flag. What's a little exercise? Something that someone can start doing straight away that's going to start to make a difference. Okay, so I think a great exercise to start with is actually just doing like a perineal lift. So perineum is that little piece of, of skin in between the vagina and the anal canal. And you can literally just do that in the cup of your own hand. No one's watching you. You can go in the bathroom if you need to. <laughs> but literally you can place a finger on that perineum. When you breathe in, it actually feels as if it's dropping down. It's expanding. Everything's expanding downstairs. 
I always think to myself, if I place my finger on the perineum and it's here and it drops down, I've got pressure now on that finger. What I'm going to try and do is pull the perineum gently away from the finger. So it, it literally just moves. You just feel as if it's probably still touching, but you just feel as if the pressure that's been applied has now released. But you'll also feel that pressure drawing up to the vaginal wall as well. You'll feel it pulling up inside of you. And that's a really great way of knowing if you can lift your pelvic floor. Because mm. it's the important part about pelvic floor exercise is not to just squeeze and hold. because That can make tight, weak muscles. It's about the elevation, the ability to lift. So I will, in a workshop, I will tell women to imagine that their lips or the vagina are around a straw and they're trying to suck up from the opening up to the pubic bone and up past the pubic bone. And if I'm doing it with men, because I work with men as well, I will tell them, imagine they're taking their testicles from the ground floor up to the penthouse. So it's that lift that you're looking for, you know, that you want them to be able to do the lift and then feel it coming back down again. When you get really good, yes, you can lift in layers and you can lift and drop, lift and drop and come down slowly. But you want to know that you can pull. And I think a great way of doing it, because sometimes people need to kind of physically feel like they're feeling it with their finger, is just to place the finger just on the outside of the underwear. You haven't got to put it, take up the underwear. Just place it there, breathe in, and then just think about trying to draw that piece of skin between the opening and the anus away from the finger so you feel the lift. And as you get that movement there, you can try to increase that lift and increase the intensity. And then just note, what do you feel happening inside of you? Because that's a really important part for you because everything that's controlled is controlled by your sensory pathways and you have to make sure that there is a connection there. And again, if you've suffered any kind of abuse or any kind of trauma or you've got negative history you're holding on to, it has the potential to shut that pathway down. Mm. Because once the breathing is altered, the pathway is challenged and you've got to try and get that breathing back in because the breath is life force energy. You want it back down there, breathe life back downstairs and then just try that lift. Thank you, Jenny. I can see, you, know, you can see the smile on my face. I think you'd have left lots of people with a smile on their face with your descriptions right. and your, you know, real openness about what we, what we can do and, and what's so easy and within our reach. And I really love that mm. era of, feedback on yourselves like really tune in and notice the difference that this is making feel those muscles feel yeah. the energy feel the effect of the breathing because I think we've got those signals that our body is sending to us all the time and it's really important to utilize that and utilize that as our own sort of mm. feedback loops of what do I need to do more of or less of or, or differently so thank you so much for for sharing that and I'm My sure pleasure. people uh, listening are going to want to tap into you because you've really made this such a an easy conversation to have. So what is the best way to reach out to you, find out more about what you do? I know you do some wonderful workshops. So work. I've got a, a masterclass actually at the end of this month on the 30th. It's online. So if you're done in the comfort of your own home or 14th of May, if you can't make the 30th of April, it's a four hour masterclass. And we are going to go through five things you need to know now to actually improve and build up your pelvic floor strength. Because as I said, my pelvic floor secrets are for sharing. Mm -hmm. And they really do encapsulate everything about our full female potential and allow us to live the life that we're supposed to live and live life better. So whether you're a mother, whether you're an aunt, whether you're a niece, whether you're a girlfriend, whether you're a sister, you know, you're a woman. And this really is an integral part of who you are and who you want to become. And also, I think just for the, the future and the tension that we're working towards in that later life don't allow this to be the one thing that debilitates how you move forward and it's really simple things that you can do and incorporate into your everyday life that will make your life really worth living because it's nothing worse than a woman that comes in and says I don't want to live mm -hmm. because they're leaking or I don't know how to talk to my husband because I don't know how to have this conversation and get back to the intimacy that they once enjoyed I want to help women change that I've helped women change that and I want to continue to help more women so you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at pelvic secrets um you can go on to, I think Alka you've got the link for the workshop haven't you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there yeah. so if you can share that link at the bottom the link will be there 
to actually click on that link and actually come along to the masterclass, either on the 30th of April or the 14th of May, which I really look forward to seeing you there. Um, or you can call me on 0207 291 <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. There's lots and lots of ways to connect with you. And certainly if if our conversation today for everyone listening has really made you think about how things could be different for you, then I would 100% recommend tapping into Jenny's workshop. She's given you a little flavor of a lot more of what she offers uh, today. So it's a workshop definitely worth uh, tapping into and finding some space in your diary to do that. So I'll yeah, put all of those this? links. Yes, can. you can. Ah. Anyone that books on can also get a copy of the free ebook as well yeah Thank you. And with this so much more on this topic, we could have talked about uh, Jenny from, as you say, from food to sleep and everything else that connects mm. as well. So uh, we must continue that conversation. But for today, thank you so much, Jenny. It's been a really open conversation. Thank you, thank you for your openness. And I'm sure lots of people have learned lots from our conversation today, which now leaves me to wish everyone a happy, healthy day. Thanks for joining us on the Lifestyle First podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share. To learn more, please visit www.dralkapatel.com.